All right, welcome back. This is Introduction to Computer Science. This is lecture number five, Hardware Layer, Computer Architecture. So in 1944 through 1945, people realized that data and instructions to manipulate data were largely the same and could be stored in the same place. The computer design built upon this principle is known as the von Neumann architecture, named after a mathematician who worked on the construction of the atomic bomb. Now here's the basic outline of the von Neumann architecture. Let's go through a couple things here in pieces. First, data flow. These lines indicate data flowing in one direction and one way direction. If you see arrows on both sides, it means data is flowing in two way connections. Each data line is called a bus and carries 32 bits of binary information. It's kind of like having a real bus with 32 seats and each seat can have one person on it. So it carries 32 bits of information. And you can see how these things are labeled on the diagram here. So basically data is flowing this way and data is flowing this way. And it's going back and forth in this particular direction. All right, next, let's talk about the central processing unit. This is the brains of the computer. And it has two parts. The first part is the control unit. The control unit controls the flow of information and actions in the computer. The next one is called the ALU, and it performs arithmetic operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and logical operations such as ands, ors, and nots. So the control unit and the ALU, these two pieces combined make up the central processing unit, or sometimes we like to call it the CPU. Next, let's talk about main memory. Main memory stores a limited amount of computer instructions and data directly on the motherboard. So this is our motherboard. And right next to the central processor unit, we have the connection between main memory. This stores the programs that you're using immediately. So for example, if you click on a Word document, it's coming directly out of main memory. Or if you click on something, and when you click on it and open your screen, it's now being stored actually in main memory. Main memory contains two types of memory, RAM and ROM. Let's look at both of them. RAM stands for random access memory, and changes depend on what information or data is currently needed. That's why we call it volatile. And this memory is deleted once the power is turned off. ROM stands for read-only memory and contains instructions needed for the computer to start up. So this is called permanent, and it stays on when the power is off. The ROM is actually embedded in your computer when you first bought it. RAM is updated every time you call something into uh, main memory. Next, let's talk about secondary memory. This is off-board, permanent until written over. It's almost unlimited, such as devices, hardware drives, memory sticks, CDs, DVDs. So for example, if I, have a, if I want to get a Word document on my computer, Word is living over here. As soon as I ask for Word in the control unit, it sends a request, and then main memory grabs Word, brings it into main memory, and then it displays it on your computer screen. So until you need it, it's actually stored over here in secondary memory. When data or instructions are needed from secondary memory, it must be transferred to main memory for the computer to use it. So what happens to the info information currently in main memory? Well, it's transferred back to secondary memory, of course. Because main memory is kind of like your desk. Your desk can only hold so much information, but you have this gigantic bookshelf of stuff you may need. And anytime you need it, you bring it to the desk. And if this desk is too crowded, you've got to kick something out and put it back in secondary memory. Output devices. A device that prints, copies, or displays data stored in memory to the outside world. So for example, monitors, printers, speakers. These are all output devices that get information out to the human. Next, input devices. Input devices are a device through which data and programs from the outside world are entered into the computer. For example, keyboard, mouse, scanners, and touch screens are all examples of input devices. Now let's look at a particular type of input device. It's called touch screens. A display device that can be touched and the computer detects where on the screen the touch was made. There's two types. There's called single touch 
and multi-touch. A single touch device acts almost just like a mouse. You basically put your finger on the screen somewhere and it registers a single touch. A multi-touch where it registers gestures. So for example, if you got an iPhone, you can do stuff like, you know, zoom and scan or rotate by moving multiple fingers around on the actual screen itself. Now multi-touch, here's an example of multi-touch where you see a person is kind of basically controlling uh, a visual map with two fingers, with two hands actually. Let's look at four types of screens. One, two, this is supposed to be three. I know that four there. And this is four. Let's look at four. One, two, three, and four. The first one is called resistive. It's basically made of two layers, vertical and horizontal lines of electricity conducting material with the space between layers. When the top layer is pressed, it comes into contact with the second layer, which allows electrical current to flow. The specific vertical and horizontal lines that make contact dictate the location of the touch. So when you touch this screen here, it's going to close it down on this bottom screen and where the touch is registered where the two horizontal vertical lines meet. Capacitive is a very small charge applied equally to the four corners of the screen. When the screen is touched, current flows to the finger. Touch points is determined by comparing the strength of the flow of electricity from each corner. So it's electrified here, it's electrified here, it's electrified here, it's electrified here. And when your finger touches the screen, our human hand conducts electricity. So it's drawing the electrical current to the finger point. And then a, a computer system monitors exactly where that point is, that electricity being drawn. Next one's called infrared. Remember, this is number three, not four. This is mislabeled. Infrared. It says screens project crisscrossing horizontal and vertical beams of infrared light just over the surface of the screen. When a user breaks the beam by touching the screen, the location of the break can be detected by sensors on the opposite side of the screen. Next one, sound ac acoustic. This is four. Screen projects high frequency sound waves across the horizontal and vertical axis. When a finger touches the surface, sensors detect the interruption to determine the location of the touch. It's, all, it's just like the capacitive, no, really, it's just like the resistive and the infrared, where instead of having light or electricity, you have sound waves across a horizontal and a vertical. Quick note, if you, use, if you have a capacitive touchscreen display and you put gloves on to shield your hand from the actual device itself, the capacitive won't allow it to conduct electricity. So... If you can put a glove on and still manipulate the screen, you got either resistive, or infrared, or sound acoustic touchscreen. All right, let's talk about some non von Neumann architectures. We're going to talk about synchronous processing, pipeline processing, and shared memory. Pipeline processing is multiple processors applying the same program to multiple data sets at the same time. So, for example, each processor might be running a grading program for a different class. So, processor one could be run the exact same program, but they run the exact same program on different data sets. And you have a control unit that's controlling all these processors. This is called synchronized processing. Pipeline processing are processors arranged like an assembly line, and each processor contributes one part of the solution and passes the results on to the next part. So this processor works on the solution and then pass it to the next one. This processor works on this, this part of the solution and pass the whole thing on. And that's called pipeline processing. The next one is called shared memory. This is where different processors run different programs on different parts of shared memory space by copying what is needed from shared memory to its local memory and then transfers back the results to the shared memory. This is kind of like cloud computing. Or really, it's kind of like the internet. So for example, processor one needs something from the, the cloud or shared memory, it grabs it, stores it to its local memory, does something on it, and then sends it back to shared memory. And at the exact same time, processor two and processor three, for example, they could be doing different things on different parts of shared memory, but then it cops it to a local device and acts on it. All right, that is the end of lecture five.